We'll talk about heterogeneous, efficient auditing of replicated state machines. Ah, uh, great. So um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, here we go. Great. So these, uh, most central banks at this point have some kind of digital currency pilot project. And I want to investigate with this talk is how, how can we actually make infrastructure that's usable at scale um, by, say, uh, everyone in the country or around the globe? So what do we need? Right. Well, at uh, the minimum, we need our system to be extensible. Uh, we're going to have to deal with use cases that might not exist yet. We also need our core infrastructure to be scalable. Um, again, we have to scale to, you know, say, everyone around the world or around, um, around the country. Um, and we also need this uh, system to be usable um, by a variety of end users. Different people have uh, heterogeneous hardware and different trust assumptions, and they all need to be able to efficiently interact uh, with the system for whatever each person's definition of efficient means. So there's been a lot of work on uh, making smart contracts and making various different virtual machines. And so existing blockchains are, say, adaptable. Um, but they're also not scalable. Um, this, what I've graphed here, is the state-of-the-art systems for executing just executing regular transactions in some kind of replicated state machine. And as you can see, um, not only do we basically top out in performance, but in, uh, in the worst case, uh, your performance is basically just flat. Um, that's sort of the opposite of being scalable. Um, now, why I'm talking about this at this workshop is that these systems are also not very easy to use for end users. Uh, if I want to interact with an existing uh, blockchain, uh, I either need some complicated trust assumption or I need a lot of hardware to run myself in my own uh, full node. Um, and so what I'm going to talk to you today is about one change um, that actually gets both of these properties at the same time. Um, in particular, I'm going to tell you how to build uh, a smart contracting engine that is both linearly scalable, um, so we get graphs that look like this. Um, I'm going to point out, not only are we linearly scalable in sort of the best case, where most transactions don't contend with each other, but we're also uh, linearly scalable in the, in the worst case, where every transaction contends with every other transaction. These are basically the same uh, workloads. Um, but also from the point of view of an end user, um, the amount of work that you have to do to do things like audit your own account balances or audit your smart contracts uh, is going to be proportional um, basically to the amount of work that uh, your transactions do. I want to audit n transactions. I should do you know, O of n work. I'm um, hiding some log factors here. Great. So just zooming out, um, the way all these things work um, is, as I'm sure you know, there's a bunch of different, uh, say, full nodes or replicas. Uh, think of many different banks. Each one maintains a copy of a shared ledger. This has a list of transactions on it. Um, when people send new transactions, this gets added to the ledger. And replicas run some consensus protocol uh, to make sure all the ledgers uh, stay in sync. Um, there's lots of different ways uh, to architect these systems. Um, you can think about decentralized or decentralized. Uh, and in fact, in some of these, uh, in, for example, a central bank digital currency, there might be only even be one uh, replica. And in, in fact, in some CBDC prototypes, um, uh, the full ledger might not be public. There might be access controls on the data. And we'd like to still somehow make a usable digital currency system, uh, even in these sort of very constrained architectures. So if you're an end user, how can you interact with uh, today's designs? Well, in one case, you can run a replica. That's expensive. Um, and your, your computational costs increase as the number of users of the system increases. Um, in the case of the CBDC, it might not be possible. You could also just trust the majority of the network. Um, but that doesn't necessarily satisfy every user. Um, and uh, it's not even clear what that means if there's only one replica. The third thing you could do, which is work at what we're going to focus on today, is to audit a replica and, for example, produce a fraud proof uh, if something goes wrong. This is what's done in optimistic rollups. This doesn't really require trusting any particular full node because I can check everything. Um, but on today's systems, if I want to actually check everything and produce a fraud proof, I just have to, the only way I can do this is to just execute all the transactions. Um, so my costs are still bad. Um, and of course, I still need access to the entire transaction history, which might not be possible if there are access controls and data. So how can we fix this? Well, the key idea is to change how we execute uh, transactions in our state machine. Um, instead of processing transactions sequentially, um, we're going to execute blocks uh, of commutative transactions in, an, uh, in a partial order. Transactions in a block are not ordered relative to each other. Um, and both of the next properties uh, depend on, on choosing this abstraction. Uh, so in the first part, I'm going to tell you about how these uh, commutative semantics work, and then we're going to explore uh, how we can um, how this enables these uh, uh, efficient 
uh, audits. So most systems uh, have some uh, abstract uh, have use the abstraction of a totally ordered log of transactions, um, and then they have a state machine that just executes transactions one by one. Um, but in practice, consensus is usually amortized over blocks of transactions. And so actually what's going on is that there's this block structure here, and we're going to take advantage of that. Um, we're going to have a state machine that consumes entire blocks of transactions one by one. Now, this sort of notion of having a commutative transaction seems kind of weird. So how can we make uh, transactions in this commutative model and that actually do useful work? How can we actually make things that can run, say, a digital currency? There's three things we need to take care of. One is how transactions read data. Another is how transactions write data to state. And the third is how we can maintain uh, certain constraints on state, uh, say, across the whole block. For the purposes of this talk, think of, uh, of state as just like a regular key value store. Um, and think as, as terms of, in terms of constraints, think about uh, the fact that uh, we want to count balances to stay non-negative. So let's look at an example. What I have here is a payment. Uh, what do we do? Well, we read a couple of account balances, we do some arithmetic, uh, and then we write out uh, a couple of account balances. Now, if there's two transactions in a block, well, if we want things to be unordered and commutative, uh, it's not possible um, semantically for one transaction uh, to read a value that is written by another transaction in that same block. And so on the read side, uh, there's a simple fix. We just make uh, all transactions read data from the same snapshot of state taken at the start of a block before any transaction processing. On the right side, uh, it's a little trickier. What happens if two transactions write to the same key? And this is where we'll let transactions surface a little bit more information about what's going on to help us. Instead of just outputting you know, a regular read and write, or a regular writes on different keys, the output of a transaction is going to be some change uh, and how that, what change is made to a key. Uh, in the case of a payment, we're subtracting and adding to different balances. After we execute a whole block of transactions, we'll iterate through all of the, um, the keys that are modified, add up all the changes, uh, and then apply them all at once. Um, and of course, because uh, things like addition and subtraction commute, uh, this guarantees commutativity in our transaction semantics. Um, but there's a problem. Uh, this problem is right here. Um, we have an account balance that is uh, non-negative. So what do we do? Well, um, we're not given blocks of transactions just out of the ether that we have to execute. Um, we're assembling them, or somebody is assembling a block uh, from transactions that stream in from users. And so what we'll do is just tell whoever uh, is assembling a block to just be very careful when they assemble that block. Um, in particular, if you're just a little bit conservative when you're choosing when to add a transaction to a block, you can maintain the invariant, uh, for example, that all account balances are non-negative. And it turns out doing this is very efficient. Um, and so not only um, is it uh, essentially linearly scalable to execute a given block, it's also uh, linearly scalable to assemble a new block of transactions. In fact, the graphs that I showed you earlier were not from executing a block. It was from assembling uh, a block of transactions from, a, 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 say, an unordered mempool. Now, uh, we don't just actually need this non-negative integer primitive. We also need things like uh, regular byte strings for uh, configuration data, public keys. Uh, we also need like a set primitive uh, for things like sets of messages or bids or replay prevention. Um, but it turns out with just uh, these three primitives, um, we can actually implement a wide variety of real world applications with minimal changes to their public APIs. So I showed you things like tokens and payments. You can also do auctions, money markets. But more importantly, um, you can actually implement uh, a sequencing gadget uh, that implements the sort of asynchronous message passing or actor model um, for smart contracts. Uh, and that's actually used in production today by large scale systems. Um, and so what we're giving essentially is a, is a uh, semantics for, um, for transactions that, you know, it looks a little weird, but it's actually more powerful and more expressive uh, and more scalable um, than things uh, that are used in production. Sort of what's going on kind of is that we're letting applications choose their own level of parallelism. Um, instead of having every transaction acquire a single lock on all global state, um, transactions you can sort of implement their own semaphores using in fact this non-negative integer primitive um, and sort of only acquire their own necessary locks. Fast applications go fast, slow ones go slowly, um, but the slow ones don't slow down the fast ones. This is all implemented, uh, it's available open source. Um, of course, again, um, putting it all, just looping back to the uh, beginning, um, 
we get these graphs that are basically linear uh, and linear scalability in both the best case and the worst case. So um, I think the main topic of this, of this talk then is how can we use this to let users interact with the system efficiently? So we're gonna make a couple of assumptions. One is that um, users have access to block headers. Um, and of course, there's been other work at this conference on how users can, uh, uh, can uh, reliably download block headers. We're gonna assume these uh, block headers have um, commitments to authenticatable data structures. Think Merkle trees. We're also gonna assume that there's some data availability system where users can query for openings uh, to these commitments. So what are we gonna need in our block header? Well, like everything else, we're gonna need a commitment to ledger state. We're gonna need a commitment to a set of transactions in that block. Um, and we're also going to make, this is what's new, uh, a, uh, an index to modifications to the ledger state. Um, essentially for every key, uh, we're gonna have a, um, an index that maps keys to uh, lists of transactions that modify that key and what deltas are applied uh, by each transaction. So how do we audit a single transaction then? Well, um, on the read side, you, if you have a block header from the current block, you have the commitment to what it's reading. So you can query for uh, the values that are read. You can also query to make sure that um, the output of a transaction is included in the modification list. And you can, and if you have the um, uh, block header uh, for the next block, you can query for the value of the key in that next block. And then you can just check uh, for all the keys that I modify. Um, uh, do the deltas, do the, do the um, committed modifications sort of add up like before and after. Um, uh, right, so does, does the, uh, uh, does the state before plus whatever modifications are in the commitment equal the state after. Um, and that sort of suffices to audit a single transaction. Um, now, why is this efficient, right? Well, if you think about how to audit a transaction, what do you need in general? Well, you need at least um, the commitment to the state right before the transaction and right after the transaction. Um, and in a sequential model, to get the uh, commitment right before the transaction, you'd have to execute all the transactions in that block that precede the transaction you're trying to audit. And same thing for the, the one immediately after, you have to execute everything after. Um, but in this model, um, I already have those two commitments by default since I have the block headers. Um, and uh, uh, of course, then, then you need the extra indexing to make sure that there's not um, extra shenanigans. And I talked about auditing a single key, um, but you can imagine audit auditing um, uh, like, for example, a user might audit their own account balance. Um, if they did that, they would incur, uh, you know, costs proportional to the number of transactions and the length of the time um, that they want to audit. A bank might audit all of its tokenized products, but, you know, and so you can go through all these, right? But in general, the, the amount of work that each, um, uh, each user incurs is proportional to the amount of transactions and the amount of keys that they are auditing. Um, I'll also point out, um, you only need your own data to audit your transactions. Um, and so if you have a CBDC, say with access controls on data, um, I can still audit and make sure that the CBDC is, is respecting my data correctly. Um, just to sort of put things in context, um, there's a lot of work out there um, that sort of shards system state into different pieces. Uh, and there's lots of rollups that uh, divide system state into pieces. This gives you some coarse granularity in terms of auditing. Um, but it really only reduces your resource requirements by like a constant factor. And you also have all these very complicated cross shard message passing mechanisms that you have to audit. And that's really hard. And so essentially sort of from the point of view of auditing, what we're giving is a method for, uh, that gives a very simple method for in, um, uh, auditing how different sort of logical pieces interact with each other. Um, because everything is in one virtual machine, uh, it's just much easier and simpler to audit. Um, so thank you very much. Um, just as a takeaway, right? If we pick the right abstractions, we'll get nice properties down the road. Um, if we pick the right abstractions, not only can we get something that's uh, computationally scalable, we can get something uh, that's efficiently auditable. And everything comes down to just picking this uh, commutative, uh, this this abstraction of commutative blocks of unordered transactions. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for the lovely talk. Um, of course, I'm I'm loving it. Commutativity, um, 
is right very much to my own personal tastes. Um, one thing I didn't fully understand was um, some stuff is clearly commutative, like, you know, trans um, simple transfers. But what about a, a smart contract that maybe has a branch statement in it? You, you, you didn't see, I didn't notice you mentioning that. So, ah. mm -hmm. yeah. So, so the model that we have is that you run an arbitrary script and then every time you read data, you read a snapshot and then you can do, do whatever computation you want. So branching, whatever. Um, and then uh, at the end of the day, like the output of your transaction is a list of modifications to keys. I see. Right. And so we're not, it's, it's, we're not um, looking at a transaction and like trying to statically analyze that it's commutative or hoping that it's commutative. We're just designing semantics such that um, uh, within a given block, all the transactions commute. But, but then you, call, you avoid when they write the same values. Um, there's. So you said you said um, you're going to track. Oh uh, right. They make? Yeah. Uh, you track the changes they make, and then if um, I guess so, one way of viewing. But that, I think I'm asking the same question as Christian here. What what if? What if the computations don't, I mean, they might be outputting modifications, but what if two operations would output different modifications depending on what order you put them in? Yeah. Uh, so semantically, they're not ordered relative to each other in a block. Um, Somehow the question is, well, I don't want to take I think, it I think we have microphone different away from here. you. Uh, keep it. Um, <laughs> but, but because, because, if if so, you look, uh, so the question maybe is, commutativity is good. I mean, what you started to describe sounded more like snapshot isolation. Kind of. And and the question is, do you look at the transactions semantically, statically before they are executed in order to say yes, this commute because some clearly will not commute. Right. Or do you because you cannot ask your programmer to write. Yeah. No, we, we don't. We don't <laughs> require programmers to like. Statically, okay, okay. if you do it. like the database does, you just let it run and you see, oops, there could be a conflict and yeah. then you abort one. Uh, yes. Um, and so sort of what we're doing here is um, you can't resolve like every possible conflict, but if you write your applications correct, like in a, in a, in a way that like th what this is doing is uh, surfacing extra information from the transaction to the runtime. And so we're sort of huh. allowing the runtime to like resolve a large fraction of conflicts in that yes, sense. Yes, but, but then semantically speaking, you don't even... You don't only get the conf commuting operations; you also get those that are that can proceed with snapshot isolation, which is a different isolation level from commutativity. Yeah. Uh, I so I'm not an expert in this stuff. I uh, I have tried to read a bunch of different papers, and I haven't quite found the same. Like it doesn't quite fit into snapshot isolation. I don't think. Um, but I haven't quite found the right sort of model of uh, okay. con consistency. That Just because you said happening. you let him run from the same state, from the same original state. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So can I, may I, just to make this very, very concrete, um, let's suppose I will give you $10, but only if I've seen Christian give you $10 first. Yeah. So now we have two transactions, Jamie and Christian. Yeah. Would this... I trust this would run on your system, but can you describe how that would work? Because these Jamie and Christian, in this case, do not commute. Christian comma Jamie is not the same as Jamie comma Christian. Yeah. Um, so uh, what would happen is that if um, Christian's transaction is in, say, block N, and your transaction comes in block N plus 1, then... That's fine. Uh, right. Then that's fine, right? Because then you can read what happens. But they couldn't right. appear in the same block. That's uh, the yeah, that's right. That's correct. That's correct. Because they wouldn't appear in the, the same system block. would would run. Well, semantically, they're not. There's no. Um, we're not. We're not saying that, like sometimes one comes before the other or whatever. It's that um, each one sort of executes in isolation, so if no transaction can see anything else that's happening in that block. See, that's why it's not Yes. <laughs> yes. So just just to really 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 dumb this down the system will ref will run or when it's contemplating what stuff to put in a block it will run them crudely put in all possible orders and check that that produces the same deltas and if it doesn't that no it's not running them in all orders it's just running them uh like there's no there's basically no coordination between the threads um so it just sort of runs uh like each thread sort of 
takes a new transaction from like a mempool or something, uh, runs it uh, to compute like what deltas are, are, are um, output by it, and then tries to go through, um, and then like this, this constraint sort of assembling system is basically like kind of like two-phase locking in a sense, um, but it uses a process like that. It's not um, uh, trying like a bunch of different permutations or something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So come back to your example. It's the one time that your transaction happens to be going to be mine, mm -hmm. so it can be transfer If it happens to be the other way around, your transaction will be transfer 10, and mine will not transfer 10. But they'd be in different. They'd be in different blocks. That's no, no, no. Even in, in, in the same block, and that's same that's block. okay. Both of the transactions started on the on what has been committed beforehand. If it happens so that my transaction and your transaction write the same value, the same account over here, then one of them has to be a vote. Probably the system. Uh, probably depends depends on how you how you do it. Thank you, Christian. Yeah. Whether my conclusion was right, but it seems your conclusion is right. So, uh, yeah, and uh, Jeff did not contradict it, so I guess uh, that's uh, um, maybe correct. Uh, I think on the read side, it's sort of snapshot isolation. I, well, yeah, yeah, um, because you can you can say, for example, this transaction has read, so no other transactions that has established a read log. And the right lock and this type of stuff, which is different things that the snapshot isolation does different things. Yeah. It's characterized by how it operates there. Um, it's possible I'm misunderstanding something. I so I, I went and read through a, uh, um like these sort of definitions of different isolation guarantees. Um, and it didn't seem like this was exactly matching, but it seems similar. But um, happy to talk more. Um, yeah. Here, the transaction single patient. Was one, for example, like. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, they like um, if these are ads, right? If these are ads, then both would be valid, and we just sort of add both together, and you'd get. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, but the output is uh, is constrained to these sort of types, and uh, the output is constrained to types that like we can statically guarantee are commutable. Okay, so we guarantee that is the type system. I see. Uh, yeah, so the type system we have is just these things, right? So. Um, also, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, good. That, right. That's like the CRDTs. Right. Uh, pretty much, yeah. Okay. It's, it's CRDTs, but CRDTs don't really do money. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to do like a cache with CRDTs in the sense of um, like the 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 fact that at every like five, few seconds or something you sort of take a snapshot and then sort of keep making progress uh, is something that you don't the CRDT do definition doesn't cover. Um, yeah, um, so this sort of gets it a little bit stronger than that. Hey, um, I wanted to ask if. Suppose like the block producers who produce individual blocks, they don't collude and we somehow select them randomly. In this case, would, would this scheme be a potential way to prevent MEV? That happens in other cases because within each block, you, there is reads from the same snapshot, right? Whereas the MEV typically comes from the fact that different transactions read different out, outcome of the previous transaction. So maybe this would prevent the MEV uh, happening. Um uh so uh yes and no right so uh, i don't want to make a claim that like this prevents all mev because mev is a sort of poorly defined concept right but uh you're right that like um if there is no order of transactions within the block then you can't adversarially order transactions sort of by definition so you eliminate that kind of a source of mev yeah thanks one, one more quick question um you mentioned uh, about optimistic rollups and uh, towards the start where you said that um, it's not efficient to audit them uh, because you have to basically run through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But the fraud proofs basically uh, do this sort of bisection uh, right. method, right? But Wherein, how, do I, how do I run that bisection game? Uh, so the effort is um, done by the rollup operator, but not the um, um, my... not the 
client who's uh, validating or but the, the client who's validating like each side has to execute transactions to figure out where they like, like so so suppose that the rollup sends me a challenge of like this is a state at you know time t uh do you agree with it or not right and the validator has to execute everything up to time t to see if they agree with it Ah, so someone has to run the whole thing to produce a fraud proof, but the fraud proofs are efficient to yeah, check. Yeah, the fraud right? proofs are efficient, I mean. but somebody still has to uh, to to do the checking. Yeah, but yeah. that's the that's just the validators who are doing this, right? Um, yes, and so so this depends on your trust model, right? And so if you um, if you trust that there is somebody who is auditing your transactions on your behalf, then maybe you don't need to audit it yourself. But uh, if we want to scale out to like a large number of people, um, not everyone's going to trust everyone and some people might only trust uh, their own hardware. And but so, it's pretty weak trust in the sense that it's just one, there should be one person at least doing the... Uh, fundamentally, yeah, you need yeah. somebody to audit each transaction. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're pointing to a, a reasonable trust model, um, but um, okay. yeah. not maybe not always satisfied. Okay. Any other questions? We still have five minutes. Okay, if not, let's thank the, the speaker again. And this concludes our workshop. Thank you everyone for uh, attending and everyone here for staying until the end. Um, safe travels. <laughs>